Welcome. In this presentation, we're going to take a look at the book of Haggai of the Old Testament, and then the first eight chapters of Zechariah. So, let's take a look at an introduction to the prophet Haggai. A prophet in Jerusalem soon after the return from the exiles. His prophecy was spoken about 520 B.C., the two chapters of the book of Haggai contain an exhortation to the people to be more zealous about the public worship of God and the rebuilding of his temple. His preaching produced the desired effect. Like so many other prophets, he taught that the temporal problems were the direct result of spiritual wickedness. I'm sorry, spiritual weakness. He told the people that their economic distress was directly caused by their failure to rebuild the temple. He reminded the people that only when God will take priority will they prosper. Thus his call to repentance is a significant one. They were to show their change of heart by rebuilding the temple. To show the significance of the work, Haggai prophesied of the future day when the temple will take on international significance. Old Testament scholar Sidney B. Sperry said, the superscription makes plain that the words of the Lord through Haggai are addressed to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judea, and to Joshua, the high priest. These men, as the civil and religious heads of the Jews, would naturally be informed of the Lord's desires first, and they would help spread the message to their people. There is an interesting point, I believe, in the fact that the word of the Lord came through Haggai and not through Joshua, the high priest. This fact would tend to show that Haggai held the Melchizedek priesthood and had no higher functions to perform in relation to Israel's religion than did Joshua, who, as high priest, had jurisdiction over the Aaronic priesthood of the Hebrew church. So you can see Haggai was a prophet after the Jews came back from their exile in Babylonia. As Zerubbabel and later Nehemiah lead back Jews from being captured and taken into exile, into captivity in Babylon, when they come back after 70 years, Haggai is a prophet during that time as they are rebuilding the temple. Haggai chapter 1, Consider Your Ways The people's excuse for not rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem after their return from exile was, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, that this people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. So they made the excuse, well, it's just not time yet to rebuild the temple. Twice Jehovah promptly responds, now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. That's in chapter 1, verse 5 and 7. I have found in Scripture, whenever Christ repeats himself, we ought to pay attention. There's a reason. So twice he tells them, consider your ways. As the people in Jerusalem dwell in fine houses made of cedar plant paneling, the temple lays in ruins and the people. Haggai 1, 2. The Lord's people had not had spiritual discernment enough to detect that there is a relationship between their conduct and his blessings upon them. That's uh, chapter 1, verse... Um, boy, I really messed that up there, didn't I? I didn't read that. It should probably be verses 6 or 11. Consequently, he must bring them into remembrance by the hand of a prophet. Haggai, like Amos at an earlier time, and Malachi at a latter, must remind Israel that God is calling her to repentance through natural agencies. Here the prophet first interprets these calamities as being due to God's anger at their selfishness. Ye look for much, and lo, it come to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why? saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house, that it is waste. So, they look to themselves. And in, in relation to everything, they, they have little, but what they bring home, it just 
You know, God can just blow it away. It's nothing. And they won't consider God's house and the importance of temple worship. The people were zealous enough over their own affairs. As it says in Haggai 1.9, Yet ye run every man into his own house. You will only take care of your own things, but you will not take care of my things, Jehovah is trying to tell them. But wholly neglectful of their obligation to God. Well, how applicable is this today? Each week during the sacrament and other times is probably a good time to consider our ways before the Lord. Am I more concerned with my needs, with my situation, with my wealth, with me, than I am with God and his kingdom and his will? Is it my will or is it God's will that will be done? So the book of Haggai has great application today to us. What are we building? Are we building God's kingdom or am I building myself? And those are good things to consider. And the sacrament's a good time to think about that. Although the Lord is doubtless highly pleased when he finds men and women spiritually sensitive enough to do the right thing without being expressly told, Nevertheless, it is comforting and satisfying to him if only they will do it at his express command. When Haggai's words went out, the rebuke was accepted by the leaders and the people of Israel, and in three weeks they were hard at work. The Lord was pleased and sent through his prophets these words, I am with you, saith the Lord. He is able to read a great many things between the lines in this account of Haggai. Or one is able to read a great many things between the, the lines. That is Haggai 1, 12 through 15. I am with you, saith the Lord. Well, he wasn't saying that before, was he? Maybe if the Lord's not in my life, maybe I'm focusing too much on me and not enough on him. Gospel principle from this, we learn, we should regularly take time to consider our ways before the Lord. Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, be strong work, I am with you, fear not. Work on the temple went on apace for nearly a month, and the construction was far enough advanced for the people to realize more vividly than ever before that the new building could not compare with the former structure of Solomon. This state of affairs must have caused them many a heartache, for most of them are disinclined to admit that the work of their hands is inferior to others. Perhaps the first wave of their enthusiasm began to pass as they contemplated the situation. As it says in verses 4 through 5 in chapter 2, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, the son of Zohedech, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I have covenant with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remain among you. Fear not. And so perhaps it is suggesting here that they couldn't make the temple as glamorous and glorious, at least in construction and materials, as Solomon's was. And maybe they were becoming discouraged, but the Lord is saying, look, I will accept any offering that you offer with your whole heart. Just be strong, continue, and fear not. That's a great lesson to us, brothers and sisters. God isn't interested in the monetary amount of our offering. He's interested that we just love him with our whole heart, might, mind, and strength. What a wonderful message. Admitting the poverty of the last bill, the latest building in comparison with the former one, the Lord exhorts his people to be courageous in facing adversity. Be strong work, for I am with you. This message, effective in the days of the Second Temple, could well be taken to heart today. 
What can a people not do if they are courageous and strong, working hard with the consciousness that God is with them? Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, the future temple in Jerusalem. Haggai prophesied of a future temple that would surpass Solomon's in glory and splendor and would be the place where the Lord would give his people peace. See chapter 9, or verse 9. This prophecy will be fulfilled in the latter day temple that will be built on the same site. We do not have a temple yet in Jerusalem. And if that's me on the exact same site, this will take a miracle indeed by Jehovah. To have that on that temple mount? Muslims own and run the temple mount proper. The Jews own the area that's the western wall. That's down below. And the two do not tread on each other's territory. That is the condition today. And so for God to one day have a temple again, more glorious than Solomon's was, on that same site, that will be a miracle and something to behold. And that is to happen before Christ comes for his millennial reign. Haggai's prophecy that the desire of all nations to come, verse 7, is a prophecy of Christ who will bring a lasting peace to the world. Lasting peace, however, we brought only after the Lord shakes the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and all nations, verse 6 through 7, when he comes in his glory to usher in the millennium. Then his house will be indeed be filled with glory. Peace will be established and the desire of all nations will be completely fulfilled. So you can see, uh, this will take quite the events for this to take place. And the desire of all nations shall come. Chapter 2, verse 7. The word desire has been personif personified by numerous commentators and identified as the Christ. Hence, we ought to consider the whole passage quite carefully. If it is actually a prophecy concerning Christ, we should give it the emphasis it deserves. And so Haggai is prophesying, if, it, if this is true and the desire of all nations come, what he's saying is that Christ, who is the king of all nations, shall come. And so Haggai prophesying of the coming of Christ. Certainly that happens in the New Testament, and this could be a dual prophecy, and it will also happen again. Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. Why did Haggai raise the question about the holy flesh and being unclean by a dead body? The two great scholars of biblical Hebrew and of the Old Testament, C.F. Kyle and F. Dillich, explained the meaning of Haggai 2, 10 through 19 in the following way. The nation, in its attitude towards the Lord, resembles, on the one hand, a man who carries holy flesh in the lappet of his garment, and on the other hand, a man who has become unclean through touching a corpse. Israel also possesses a sanctuary in the midst of its land namely the place which Jehovah has chosen for his own abode and favored with many glorious promises. But just as no kind of food, neither bread nor vegetables, neither wine nor oil, is sanctified by the fact that a man touches it with his sanctified garment, so all, so will all that is that, let me try again, so will all this not be rendered holy by the fact that is planted in the soil of the land which surrounds and encloses the sanctuary of Jehovah. For Israel is utterly unclean on account of its neglect of the house of Jehovah. Like a man who has become unclean through, come unclean through the touching of a corpse, everything that Israel takes hold of or upon which it lays its hand, everything that it plants and cultivates is from the very first affected with the curse of uncleanliness. And consequently, even the sacrifices which it offers there upon the altar of Jehovah are unclean. 
So just because we have a temple and it's on land doesn't make it clean. It must be dedicated by the Lord as a person is and then remain clean by the people who use it. If we would let unclean people into the temple, then the temple would be unclean. And so he's saying, just because a man carries holy flesh, meaning a sacrifice that has been offered on the altar around, does not automatically make him holy. No, the person has to become clean. If he's unclean, just because you offered something like a lamb or something, an offering on the altar, and part of it's given back to you, that doesn't clean you. It's your devotion to Christ and changing the natural man, the inward heart. Israel was wicked, therefore the temple had become unclean. The uncleanliness was the reason the land was so unproductive. That's verses 15 through 17. Now that is something to consider, brothers and sisters. It wasn't due to climate change that they had unpredictive crops. It was their righteousness. Instead of maybe focus on climate catastrophe, which is man-made disasters made up by man to control people. The government can control people over their lives. Maybe instead of focusing on that, we should focus on our righteousness, keeping the Sabbath day holy if we want our land to be productive. Keeping the Sabbath day. Let's try that. But when the Jews had repented and begun to work on the temple, verse 18, the curse was lifted and the Lord promised his blessings. Verse 19, they were productive. The land was productive. Let's not get caught up in the false philosophies and ideologies and the quackery of the last days that people and governments will come up with just to try to control you. One of those will be a nonsensical thing called climate change. Does climate change? Well, of course it does. We call it weather. We call it fall, winter, summer, and spring. Now, catastrophic and apocalyptic in t two years from now, or eight, or ten, or even a hundred. Oh, get real. Give me rest. Jehovah knew and created the fossil fuels we use and inspired people on how to get them out of the ground so that we can have cheap energy. Unless Christ doesn't know what he's doing, then climate change as a catastrophic thing to control people is what's going on. Haggai chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. Why was Zerubbabel compared to a signet ring? The meaning of the figurative expression to make Zerubbabel as a signet ring is evident from the importance of the signet ring in the eyes of an oriental who is accustomed to carrying his signet ring constantly about with him and to take care of it as a very valuable possession. Hence, we obtain this thought for our present passage, namely, that on the day on which Jehovah would overthrow the kingdoms of the nations, he would make Zerubbabel like a signet ring, which is inseparable from its possessor. That is to say, he would give him a position in which he would be and remain inseparably connected with him, Jehovah, would therefore not cast him off, but take care of him as his valuable possession. That's what we want. We want to become a signet ring unto Jehovah, a valuable possession that he cherishes, and we are inseparable from him. Well, that's up to you and me, brothers and sisters. That'll be up to how you and I use the sacrament, how we use our baptismal covenants, and how we use our temple covenants. The prophecy is messianic, and Zerubbabel in the scriptures served as a type of Christ. Christ will one day come, 
and overthrow the kingdoms of the nations. Kyle and Dilich explained, In order to clearly understand the meaning of this promise, we must look at the position which Zerubbabel occupied in the community of Israel on its return from exile. For we, we may at the outset assume that the promise did not apply to his own particular person, but rather to the official post he held, from the fact that what is here predicted was not to take place till after the overthrow of the throne and might of all the kingdoms of the heathen, and therefore could not take place in Zerubbabel's lifetime, inasmuch as, although the fall of this or the other kingdom might be looked for in the course of one generation, the overthrow of all kingdoms and the coming of all the heathen to fill the temple of the Lord with their possessions, verse 7, certainly could not. Zerubbabel was a Persian governor in Judea and had no doubt been selected for his office because he was prince of Judah. That's in Ezra 1.8. And, and as son of Shealtiel was a descendant of the family of David, Haggai 1.1. 1, 1. Consequently, the sovereignty of, the, of David in its existing condition of humiliation under the sovereignty of the imperial power was represented and preserved in his appointment as prince and governor of Judea so that the fulfillment of the divine promise of the eternal perpetuation of the seed of David and his kingdom was then associated with Zerubbabel and rested upon the preservation of his family. Hence, the promise points to the fact that at the time when Jehovah would overthrow the heathen kingdoms, he would maintain and take good care of the sovereignty of David in the person of Zerubbabel. For Jehovah had chosen Zerubbabel his servant. With these words, the messianic promise made to David was transferred to Zerubbabel and his family among David's descendants and would be fulfilled in his person, in just the same way as the promise given to David that God would make him the highest among the kings of the earth. That's Psalms 89.27. The fulfillment culminates in Jesus Christ, the son of David, and the descendant of Zerubbabel. That's Matthew 1.12 and Luke 3.27. In whom Zerubbabel was made the signet ring of Jehovah. Jesus Christ has raised up the kingdom of his father David again, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Luke 1.32-33. Even though it may appear oppressed and deeply humiliated for the time by the power of the kingdoms of the heathen, it will never be crushed and destroyed, but will break in pieces all these kingdoms and destroy them, and it will itself endure forever. In other words, Zerubbabel was continuing on the line of David that the kings of Israel would come through. And the king of kings who will finally reign, that is a little descent of David, is Jesus Christ, the great Jehovah. Well, let's turn now to Zechariah, chapters 1 through 8. Let's get a little introduction into Zechariah. Zechariah, whose name means Jehovah remembers, was the son of Barak. Berechiah, who was the son of Edo, the prophet. Edo was one of the priests and the Levites whom accompanied Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatil, home from exile in Babylon. The book of Zechariah has two divisions, Zechariah 1 through 8, a series of visions sketching the future of the people of God, and Zechariah 9 through 14, prophecies about the Messiah and events preceding his second coming. This presentation will deal with just the first division, chapters 1 through 8. Some confuse Zechariah with Zacharias mentioned in the New Testament, as in Matthew 23, 35, and Luke eleven fifty one. 51. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, however, that they are two different individuals. You can see that in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 261. The Aramaic of the passages in Ezra mentioned above show that Zechariah took a part 
with Haggai in instigating the work of the building of the second temple. One of these passages reads as follows. And the elders of the Jews were building and prosper, prospering through the prophesy of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edo. And they built and furnished it by the commandment of God of Israel and by the decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. So you can see that Haggai and Zechariah would be contemporaries of each other. The Jews were under the domination of the Persians, who had permitted them to return and build the temple. They faltered, however, and became poor and despondent. They lost their initial enthusiasm, and not until Haggai, Hag, well, I apologize, Haggai and Zechariah preached to them and revived their spirits did they get the temple underway. It was under these conditions that Zechariah did his work. So, let's turn to chapter 1. Let's consider verses 2 through 4, call for Israel to repent. Because Jehovah has been displeased with the children of Israel and her fathers, Zechariah implores the following. Chapter 2, verse 3. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. So Zechariah prophesies and preaches to them, Please turn. Now I'm going to get into this word and what it means and the implications it has for the doctrine of repentance. Because this word is used, this word in Hebrew, turn, is used to repent. And so let's take a minute to consider this word and its importance and implications. Turn in Hebrew is shuv, meaning to turn back, return, turn away, or bring back. It is the twelfth most frequently used verb in the Old Testament, appearing over 1,050 times. The basic meaning implying physical motion or movement appears over 270 times. So, and a lot of times it literally means physically turn around. You're going the wrong direction. Turn around. Turn physically. You can see why this would be used for repentance. You're moving in the wrong direction. Physically turn your life around. Of all the Hebrew expressions of man's need for repentance are summarized by this one verb, shuv. For better than any other verb, it combines in itself the two requirements of repentance. To turn from evil and to turn to the good. In passages dealing with the covenant relationship with God, Returning to God in the sense of repentance, turning from evil in the sense of renouncing sin, or turning away from God apostasy, is used 129 times. The fact that the people are called to turn either to or away from implies that sin is not an ineradicable stain. But by turning to God, given power, a sinner can redirect his destiny. Now consider that. When I sin, I have sinned. I cannot eradicate it. And I'm going to show you in a minute that the Savior does not eradicate. When we sin, the stain is there. Hence the problem. That sin is not eradicated and is taught in the scriptures. Consider the following. Uh, consider the following in light of that when I sin, it's there and there's nothing I can do to get rid of it. And so take a look what the scripture teaches what the Savior does. Blessed is he who transgression is forgiven, who sin is covered. That's Psalms 32.1. See, isn't that interesting? It's covered by something. And so that it appears as if it's not there, or, and at least the consequences are no longer there. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. 
that Psalms 85 too. See again, there's that idea that God covers them. And when he covers them, they're as if they're not there. But if he doesn't do that, see, they stay. I, there's nothing I can do to get rid of it. Isaiah 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robes of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh herself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Why do I want the robes of righteousness? Those who have been endowed in the temple. Why do I want temple garments? Why is God covering me? Why do I want robes of the priesthood? See, robes of righteousness. What are they covering? And why is that so important? Take a look at Romans chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Even as David also describeth the blessings of the man whom, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. Now look what forgiveness is. And whose sins are covered. God covers them. If I am covered with the robes of righteousness, it's as if they are not there, even though they still are. They are forgiven. I am not then accountable to the consequences of that, meaning spiritual death being kept out of the presence of God. I put on his righteousness and I can become like him. Look at Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 3.34. This is when the Pharisees and stuff go to see John the Baptist. And he chides them for, why are you coming? You don't believe in me. And he says, why is it that you receive not the preaching of him whom God has sent? He's talking about him. Why don't you, why don't you believe me? I'm God's messenger, John the Baptist. If you receive not this in your hearts, meaning the gospel of my message, you receive not me, and if you receive not me, you receive not him of whom I am sent to bear record. That was the Christ. And for your sins, you have no cloak. Isn't that interesting? They can't be covered. Exactly what we've just been reading. Brothers and sisters, I want my sins covered by somebody. I can't cover them. Oh, I can cover them in terms of trying to deceive people and act like I'm righteous when I'm not and I haven't repented. I can try to cover myself. But if I want them covered for real, for eternity, and not be, and, and overcome the consequence of them keeping me out of God's presence, well, that's a whole different matter. For your sins, you have no cloak. You can't cover them. They would not listen to John and come unto Christ. Therefore, they could not use the gospel and Jesus Christ and his atonement to cover them. How about this in 2 Nephi, chapter 4, verses 31 through 33. Listen to this carefully. O Lord, wilt thou redeem my soul? Wilt thou deliver me out of the hands of my enemies? Wilt thou make me that I may shake at the presence of sin? May the gates of hell be shut continually before me, because that my heart is broken and my spirit is contrite? O Lord, wilt thou not shut the gates of thy righteousness before me, that I may walk in the path of the low valley, that I may be strict in the plain road? O Lord, wilt thou encircle me round in the robe of thy righteousness. Here's Nephi. Please, please cover me in your robes of righteousness. O Lord, wilt thou make a way for mine escape from before mine enemies? Wilt thou make my path straight before me? Wilt thou not place a stumbling block in my way, but... May thou not place a stumbling block in my way, but that thou wouldest clear my way before me, and hedge not up my way, but my way, but the way of mine enemy. What is our greatest enemy? 
that it is going to take a robe of righteousness to overcome. Well, let's take a look. How about 2 Nephi 9.10? Oh, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth a way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster. Now that, to me, is an enemy. Yea, that monster, death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also the death of the spirit. Isn't that the enemy I want to escape from? Well, why does death and hell come? Because of the fall, because of sin. The resurrection will take care of the death of the body. But what about hell, spiritual death, being separated from father? That is going to take covering my sins because no unclean thing can enter the kingdom of God. And so my stains of sin must be covered and I become clean. Look at 2 Nephi 9, 13 through 14. Oh, how great the plan of our God. For on the other hand, the paradise of a God must deliver up the spirits of the righteous, and the graves deliver up the body of the righteous, and the spirit of the body is restored to itself again, and all men become incorruptible, immortal, immortal, and they are living souls, having a perfect knowledge, like unto us in the flesh, save it be that our knowledge shall be perfect. So that's just as I said, the resurrection takes care of physical death. Now verse 14, wherefore? We shall have a perfect knowledge of all our guilt, of our uncleanliness, and our nakedness. Okay? If, now, if, if, if I haven't repented of them, but now look what he says to the righteous, those who've used repentance. And the righteous shall have a perfect knowledge of their enjoyment and their righteousness, being clothed with purity, yea, even the robe of of righteousness. That's what Jesus Christ atonement does. It covers me in righteousness. I get to put him on. That's why we talk about putting on Christ. I put him on and I can use his righteousness because there is not enough in me there's hardly any in the natural man. No, there's none in the natural man. There is not enough of me to make me righteous. And so through repentance and the atonement, Christ says, you can put on my robe of righteousness and be like me. And therefore, you can be clean and come back into Father's presence. No wonder we are in such a mess in mortality, brothers and sisters. The moment you and I sin, the stain is there for eternity. When we sin, we cannot escape its stain. It's an impossibility. That's why it says in the scriptures that because of the fall, we are lost forever. We become unrighteous, unjust, unclean, for no unclean thing can enter the kingdom of God. And we become guilty before the law. We're guilty before God. Well, if you're guilty, you have to be sent away. You can't stay with Father. First Nephi 15.34 For behold, I say unto you, the kingdom of God is not filthy, and there cannot any unclean thing enter into the kingdom of God. Wherefore, you must needs be place of filthiness prepared for that which is filthy. And when I sin, if the stain's there and it remains, I somehow need something to cover the stain. And we've just been reading that's what the Savior's atonement does. It covers me in righteousness. The word for atonement in the Old Testament is kafar, meaning to cover over. And specifically, when used for atonement, means to cover specifically with blood. Thus, the atoning blood of the Savior's atonement covers our stain of sin and enables us to put on 
the purity, righteousness, holiness, and guiltlessness of the Holy One of Israel and become once again innocent as a child. This is why coming into Christ is important. This is why ordinances and covenants are important. This is why repentance daily is important. So that I can put on Jesus Christ's righteousness and walk therein. Look at Galatians 3.27 says, For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Isn't that interesting? He uses the words, put him on. Baptism is the gate in which we put him on. And then the temple completes the process and completely, totally, for eternity, those ordinances and covenants, if I am faithful, will for eternity cover the stain of my sins. That's why we need baptism in the temple. That's why we need Christ. That's why we need the sacrament to always remember him. Therefore, our desperate need for a redeemer, one who could accomplish the transfer of ownership from one to another through the payment of a price or an equivalent substitute. That's what a redeemer does. The Savior's atoning sacrifice in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross enables him to be a suitable substitute and payment for our sins, enabling our transfer from death and hell to ownership by him. It allows him to use his righteousness to cover ours because he is a suitable substitute. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. And that was the royal blood of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. That's the currency that paid for us. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God gods he has bought and paid for us we belong to him do not ever excuse your weaknesses and sins because oh it's my life it's my body i can do what i want no first corinthians 6 19 through 20 is clear it is not our own it is not ours and we will have to answer to everything we do for the body he paid for we are on the rent-to-own program. You want the same body for eternity in the presence of Father and to become like Him and have the blessings of Him? Then you better rent this thing properly so that you can own it one day. Thus, only through repentance in and through the atonement of Jesus Christ can we have our sins covered in robes of purity and righteousness, allowing us to become pure and clean again to enter the kingdom of God. What was it saying? 3 Nephi 27, 19. And no unclean thing can enter into his kingdom. Therefore, nothing enter into his rest, save it be those who have washed their garments in my blood. See, we have to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. What's the Hebrew word for atonement in Hebrew? To cover with blood. Kafar. Who have washed their garments in my blood because of their faith and the repentance of all their sins and their faithfulness unto the end. Well, what is faith? Faith is doing what God wants, when he wants it done, and how he wants it done regardless of the outcome. 
So I become baptized. I repent. I covenant to follow him. And if I will stay faithful in doing God's will, how he wants, when he wants, and when he wants it done, then my life will be washed in the blood of Christ and his blood will cover me and cover my stains. See, my blood is stained. I need it covered with a pure blood. And God remembers them no more. Doctrine and Covenants 58, 42-43 Behold, he who has repented of his sins, the same is forgiven. And I, the Lord, remember them no more. They're covered. By this you may know if a man repents of his sins. Behold, he will confess them and forsake them. We need the power of the Savior's atonement and his grace to do both of those, confess and forsake them. We cannot do that alone. Therefore, there are two sides in our conversion. First, the free sovereign act of God's mercy, his grace, and man's going beyond contrition and sorrow to a conscious decision of turning to God. See, this is why we have to turn to him. This is why this word is used so much for repentance. I must turn and come unto Christ, which includes a repudiation of all sin and a fur affirmation of God's total will for one's life. Turning and coming into Christ is that I will forsake all my sins. And we have a probationary period to work on that, thank goodness. It's not done in one moment. And then I totally commit my life to his will. And even after I do those two things, brothers and sisters, even after I repent and confess and forsake and totally turn, Shuv, turn my life to him and covenant to only do his will. And again, we have a probation period to work on that. Even after I do all that, it is still only, only because of God's grace, Christ's grace that we are saved. Please remember, in the end, when it's all said and done, we are literally saved only because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't negate that he's asked us to do certain things. I've already explained and laid that out for you. But when it comes down to the end of it, the end result is because of the cry, grace of Christ, will he save us? Ether 1227. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them weakness. Notice it's singular. Why didn't he say I will show them their weaknesses? Because I have more than one. I don't know about you. I'm guessing you do too. I will show them their weakness, meaning our fallen state. That's what that word means. If you'll come into me, I'll show that, yes, you are fallen. That's the one weakness we all have that accounts for all the others, that causes all the others. I will give unto men weakness, meaning the natural man because of the fall, that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. My grace is sufficient to save you from the fall, from your natural man. For the natural man is an enemy of God and will be for ever and ever, unless he yields unto the enticing of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man through the atonement of Jesus Christ. That's the only way to get rid of the natural man. Back to either. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then I will make weak things. I will make the natural man. I'll take it away. I'll help you get rid of it. And then you'll become strong. Ether 12, 27 is all about the fall, the natural man, how to overcome it. It will only be done through the grace of Jesus Christ and our humility and faith. 2 Nephi 10, 23-24, Therefore cheer up your hearts and remember that you're free to act for yourselves. I will not force you to do any of this. 
to choose the way of everlasting death or the way of eternal life. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, reconcile yourselves to the will of God and not to the will of the devil in the flesh. And remember, after ye are reconciled unto God, after you've repented, after you've entered the way, after you have faith and you are steadfast in Christ, remember that it is only in and through the grace of God that ye are saved. Please get out of our hearts and our heads that we have anything to do with it. Because if I had any power to save myself, I wouldn't need him. Because he is the author of salvation, he can now make the conditions. And the conditions are faith, repentance, and covenants. That's the conditions. But even after I meet the conditions, it's still because of his grace. That's how grace and work works go together. Romans 5, 1 through 2. Well, how do I access God's grace? See, that's what I want to know too. Therefore, being justified by faith, meaning because of our faith, we can become cleaned up. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's how I access God's grace. Grace is not unconditional. It's conditional upon faith and repentance. And then because of his love, he grants it to me. Now, what does it mean, faith, by access, by faith? Faith is not just something I say with my lips and I believe. That would be worthless. That would do nothing for us. That's a silly notion of Satan that he's given to other Christian religions. Faith is doing God's will. That's what, doing what God wants, when he wants, and how he wants it done, regardless of the outcome. Because sometimes he may ask you to go through a disease and illness and then die. Do you have enough faith to do that? He is not going to heal every one of us because maybe that's not the program for you or I. Maybe the program is I'm to learn certain things and then I am to go through death maybe earlier than I wanted to. Or my family wanted me to. Or I wanted someone in my family, a spouse or a child to. But faith is that regardless of the outcome, Father, I will follow you in your will, regardless of the outcome. You want to talk about outcomes? Ask Abinadi what outcome he would have rather had. I don't think burning by fire was on his to-do list that day. How about the outcome for John the Baptist, who will lose his head, because he had the courage to only follow Jesus Christ. Let's get out of our hearts and our heads this stupid, silly notion that faith is if I believe hard enough, I'll get my way. Oh, no. Sometimes God will ask us to go through things and not take them away. Do you have enough faith to go through it? Because he wants to teach us and test us and improve us. And you don't want to improve your children by constantly giving them what they want. They become spoiled. What do you makes you think a heavenly father, a God, would do that? May we follow him regardless of the outcome. That's what faith is. Therefore, we must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ and endure to the end enabling us to grow from grace to grace until we reach the perfect day. What does it say in Doctrine and Covenants 50.24? That which is of God is light, and he that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day.
Well, let's move on to Zechariah. Chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, the word of the Lord is always fulfilled. Zechariah told the people who came out of exile from Babylon that they were witnesses to the fulfillment of the word of God and that he gave through the prophets to their forefathers. Kylan Dealey suggested that Zechariah said, Your fathers have indeed been long dead, and even the prophets do not or cannot live forever. But notwithstanding this, the words of the earlier prophets were fulfilled in the case of the fathers. The words and decrees of God uttered by the prophets did reach the fathers, so that they were ob obliged to confess that God had really done to them what he threatened. That is, he carried out the threatened punishments. And so that's the explanation of verses 5 and 6 and what that means and how God's word is always fulfilled, even when he says things to prophets long ago. Zechariah pleaded with the people not to resist the words of the prophets as the forefathers had done. Zechariah chapter 1, verses 7 through 6. We get, I'm, we get eight symbolic night visions. That, that reference is not right. It's chapter 1, 7 through, and then it goes through chapter, chapter 8. I apologize, that's what it means. Zechariah chapter 1, 7 through chapter 6, verse 8. Eight symbolic night visions now are given. The occasion of the visions is the growing impatience of the returned exiles. They could perceive no sign of God's presence or of his interest in their labors and difficulties. Haggai had assured them that in a little while God would shake the kingdoms and his, fill his house with glory. But time passed and there was no sign of this. The people began to lose faith in God. These visions of Zechariah thus came as a, at a most important crisis. To his countrymen, they were a bright panorama of hope, revealing the marvelous province of God and his love for his people. So, here is the first vision he has. Chapter 1, verses 7 through 17, is the angelic band of horsemen. The first vision assures them that God knows every detail of their circumstance. His messenger Messengers are even on the alert, bringing tidings to their king from all parts of the earth. A man riding upon a red horse is probably the angel of the Lord. In this scene, enacted in the valley bottom, he is the protector of God's people. Aspects of the divine providence are represented in the colors of the heavenly scouts. Red depicts battle and bloodshed, white depicts victory and peace, sorrel speckled, that is reddish-brown, is the aftermath of confusion in the unsettled period after the end of the hostility. The rider sent out by God now returned to report that the earth is by no means shaken and is by no means shaken and in motion, but the whole world sits quiet and at rest. We must not indeed infer from this account that the writers were all sent for the simple and exclusive purpose of obtaining information concerning the state of the earth and communicating it to the Lord, for it would have been quite sulfurous and unmeaningful to send out an entire troop on horses of different colors for this purpose alone. Their mission was rather to take an active part in the agitation of the nations, if any such existed, and guide it to the divinely appointed end, and that in the manner indicated by the color of their horse, the, according to Revelation 6, those upon the red horse by war and bloodshed, and those upon the starling gray or speckled horses by famine and pestilence and other plagues, and lastly, those upon the white horse by victory and the conquest of of the world. So the different horses, the night vision, different messenger of God going out, causing different things to hopefully change people's hearts and bring them back to God. Whether that's through war, pestilence, conquest, whatever. For 70 years, Jerusalem lay in ruins after the terrible destruction by the Babylonians at the time of King Zedekiah, king of Judah. 
Zechariah now prophesied of a time when the land of Judah would again prosper. Cities would cover the land, and Jerusalem would be rebuilt and be adorned with the temple. The Lord will yet accept his people and own Jerusalem. Here again was a dualistic prophecy. Jerusalem was rebuilt under Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, and again became the capital of the Jewish nation. But in AD 70, Rome destroyed Jerusalem and the Jews as a nation. Not until 1948, when Israel once again became an independent nation, did Jerusalem again become the seat of government for a Jewish nation. On the 13th of December, 1949, the Israeli government announced that Jerusalem was and re would remain Israel's eternal capital. Number 2, chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, the four horns and the four craftsmen. So the explanation of that vision. Zechariah is first shown four horns, which symbolize power, that are said to have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. He is then shown four craftsmen whose duties are to frighten and cast down the horns of the nations or the powers which scattered Judah. The Lord told Zechariah that the builders would fray and cast out the four horns. Kylan Delich noted, the vision does not show what powers God would use for this purpose. It is simply designed to show to the people of God that every hostile power of the world which has risen up against it or shall rise up is to be judged and destroyed by the Lord. In other words, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will not be destroyed, brothers and sisters. God's kingdom will eventually arise. Nothing can stop this. As mentioned in Doctrine and Covenants section 109, the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple. No weapon is formed that will be able to destroy God's purposes. The craftsmen are the forces that in part have already broken down or shall yet break down the powers that have scattered Israel. Vision number three, chapter two, verses one through 13, the man with the measuring line. Why wasn't, Jerusalem, why wasn't Jerusalem to be measured? Jerusalem is in future to resemble an open country covered with unwalled cities and villages. I'm sorry, Jerusalem is in, in the future to resemble that. It will no longer be a city closed, encircled with walls. Hence, it will be extraordinarily enlarged on account of the multitude of men and cattle with which it will be blessed. Moreover, Jerusalem will then have no protecting wall surrounding it because it will enjoy a superior protection. Jehovah will be to it a wall of fire round about, that is to say, a defense of fire which will consume everyone who ventures to attack it. Uh, compare Isaiah 4, 5 and Deuteronomy 4, 24. Jehovah will also be the glory in the midst of Jerusalem. That is to say, will fence the city with his glory. You can obviously see that this vision is millennial. That Jerusalem will be this kind of a city is a millennial condition. Not until modern times has the city of Jerusalem grown beyond its walls. Verse 7 which says, Ho, Zion, escape that, that dwellest there with the daughters of Babylon, seems undoubtedly referred to our present day Israel, which has received the command, Go ye out from among the nations, even from Babylon, from the midst of wickedness, which is spiritual Babylon. Stop and Covenants 133, 14. The apple of the eye, literally the gate, the opening in which the eye is placed, or more probably the pupil of the eye, pupula, as being the object most carefully preserved, is a figure used to denote the dearest possession or good, and in this sense is applied to the nation of Israel as early as Deuteronomy 32.10. The fourth vision... Chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, Joshua, the high priest, bears the sins of himself and his people. Most scholars agree that the Joshua referred to here was the high priest of the time. But in typical prophetic fashion, there is dualism in this prophecy. Joshua, Hebrew Yeshua, or Greek Hayesus, English Jesus, was a type of Jesus Christ. 
In other words, all it's saying is that the way you say Jesus in Hebrew is Joshua. The great high priest. The chapter is messianic. So the high priest Joshua then was, sim was symbolic of the great high priest Joshua, or Jesus, that's how you say his name in Greek, of the messianic period. If you were in the time of Christ in the New Testament and someone yelled his name, you wouldn't hear them yell, Jesus. Now, that's what we say. Someone back then would have said, Yeshua, Joshua. From the promise of a glorious future for the city and the people of God, Zechariah turns to the means by which they are to be achieved. God will raise up a perfect priestly mediator of whom Joshua and his fellow priests are a foreshadowing. So the priest Joshua of Zechariah's time was symbolic of the priest Joshua, Jesus Christ, who would mediate Israel. Joshua is opposed by Satan. See Zechariah 3.1. Not on account of any personal offense, either in his private or his domestic life, but, by, but in his official capacity as high priest, and for sins which were connected with his office, or for offenses which would involve the nation, Leviticus 4.3, though not as the bearer of the sins of the people before the Lord, but as laden with his own and his people's sins. The dirty clothes which he had on point to this. Christ would take care of our dirty clothes. Remember, we're going to be clothed in robes of righteousness. We need clean clothing. The garments of filthiness represent sin. Changing the garment symbolizes doing away with the old and putting on the new, which would be robes of righteousness. That through repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Zechariah 3, 8 through 10. Who is the branch and what is the stone? Many see this as a messianic reference. Joshua and his fellow priests are a sign of God's favor, which will culminate in the appearance of the branch, that is, the Messiah King, Jesus Christ. So also on the stone, with its seven eyes or facets, the stone appeared to be the headstone of the temple. Remember what Christ said, I'm the cornerstone? God will engrave in the name of his Messiah as a token of national sin forgiven. Seven eyes symbolizes God's watchful care over his people, guarding them against their enemies. Seven is also the symbolic number used for um, perfection. And so God's perfect eye will watch over. The fifth vision Chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. The golden candlestick and the two olive trees. The candlestick represents Judah, who had returned from exile in Babylon. The golden candlestick, that is, the returned exiles, received its supply of oil, that is, divine grace, through two channels, pipes, via the spiritual and the temporal leaders, Joshua and Zerubbabel, through whose united efforts the prosperity of the nation would be accomplished. The two olive trees represent Joshua and Zerubbabel. Joshua and Zerubbabel can be seen as messianic types who, as spirit-filled men, convey blessings from God to church and state and are a type of the Messiah as priest and king. The same imagery was used by John in Revelation 11.4. The mountain represents the obstacle that stood before Zerubbabel as he tried to complete the temple. The mountain became a plain, that is, the obstacle was removed, and Zerubbabel was able to complete his work on the temple. Well, who is the ultimate person that will remove the ultimate mountain in our life so that we can complete our journey to him? Well, that's Jesus Christ, isn't it? Zechariah 4.10, the eyes of the Lord, the prophet Joseph Smith changed this phrase to the servants of the Lord. That makes a big difference. Scornful doubters shall by this success be put to shame. They shall see Zerubbabel moving the plumb line to test the completed walls. Plumb line is to make sure things are level and straight in construction. 
Revelation 11, 3, 4 suggests that in the candlesticks and the olive trees, Zechariah may have also, also have reference to the two prophets whom the Lord shall raise up in the latter days to save the Jews from their enemies. So there may again be dual prophecy taking place here. Okay, the sixth vision that he has is the flying roll, chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. I know a lot of jokes you can make about that, but I'll, <laughs> I'll move on. The roll was a scroll or book which Zechariah saw flying through the air. The flying scroll appears to represent the main provisions of the law, both moral and religious, and symbolize the divine standard of holiness. Its flight in the heavens show from which quarter judgment comes and also the speed of its ex execution. Two particular sins are condemned, one on each side of the scroll, according to the force of the Hebrew. The curse lights upon every thief and perjurer, theft and lying being typical sins of a poor community. So those are the two um, sins. Theft, perjury, and then theft, perjury, or theft and lying. So penetrating and permanent is the penalty that it enters and consumes the very structure of the house of the wrongdoer as though the building were defiled by leprosy. And, and you think about it, uh, those are some of the two sins that encompass a lot of all of others, isn't it? Perjury, lying, deceiving. Theft, taking which not is ours. We do that through not paying tithing and our offerings and different things. We can steal other people's self-esteem by the way we treat them and abuse. So you can see why they chose these two things. It is interesting to note that the two sins that symbolize the standard of holiness were theft and swearing falsely. We see in Malachi 3, 8 through 10, how we can rob God in our lack of paying tithes and offerings, and that swearing falsely or deceitfully is what keeps one from having a pure heart. Let me show you the connection. Psalms 23, 3 through 4, this is the only place in scripture where it tells you what it means to have a pure heart. Notice that the definition of Zion are the pure in heart. Zion is God's people, is God's city, God's condition, his ways. The celestial kingdom is Zion. Exaltation will be a Zion. In other words, you cannot live with God without being pure in heart. So let's see what it tells us about being pure in heart. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? Well, only he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Now he's going to define those. A clean hand are those who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity. So the things he does, hands, denotes the things we do, actions. My actions aren't vain. They're not worthless. Okay? Now, what is a pure heart? Nor sworn deceitfully. So someone who does not make vows or oaths or covenants or ordinances or whatever and do them deceitfully, do not swear deceitfully. You do that and you do not have a pure heart. Pure heart is those who will make oaths and covenants and keep them. That's the pure in heart. And so that is very significant in our lives. You want to be pure in heart? Do not partake of the sacrament and then that week... Do not keep the commandments of God. You just swore as you partake of that sacrament that you will always remember him, keep his commandments so that his spirit may always be with you. And so if you do that and then you go out and purposely not keep them, not pay your tithing, see if I, don't think that, well, I'm active in the church so if I just don't pay my tithing, it's okay. no. Not paying your tithing and partaking the sacrament, you're swearing that you will. And then you then you don't? That means you have sworn deceitfully. Therefore, you cannot have a pure heart. The seventh vision that he has is chapter 5, verses 5 through 11, the woman in the ephah. 
To understand this vision, it's necessary to understand several symbols. First, an ephah is a round vessel that was one of the largest measures of capacity among the Jews. So an ephah of wheat, a round vessel that held a certain amount, largest measure, like a bushel or whatever. Talent of lead. The talent was the largest measure of weight. A talent of lead suggests a very weighty matter, something that's very heavy. Woman, a symbol of Israel and her sins. Shinar is a symbol of Babylon or the world. See Genesis 10.10 for that symbol. Zechariah saw in the vision the woman being put in an ephah, covered with a lid made of lead, and carried away into Babylon. Babylon was regarded as the counterpart of Zion and the proper home of all that is evil, especially sin such as fraud and false swearing. The vision is remarkable. God not only forgives the sins of his people, but carries them altogether away from their land that they may deceive them no more. What a beautiful vision, beautiful symbolism. The last vision he has, number eight, is chapter six. What was the last one? Well, I thought that'd be chapter six, verses one through 18, the four chariots. I apologize for not putting that in right. Or it's chapter six, one through eight. Hmm. Uh, probably chapter six, one through eight. The prophet Joseph Smith changed the phrase four spirits to read four servants. See the JST Zechariah 6 5. It's probably in the footnote. Well, no, it's probably not all of the Joseph Smith translation footnotes are in our scriptures. This major change is vital to an understanding of these verses. Servants of the Lord are priesthood holders who labor to bring about the purposes of God. The servants came from between two mountains, two places where the Lord will judge the nations, which were made of brass, a symbol of firmness. The four servants went through the earth in chariots drawn by horses of different colors. The black horse and the only ones not previously mentioned seem to represent death or mourning. John the Revelator also spoke of the four servants, or angels, who stood at the four corners of the earth. See Revelation 7, 1 through 3. On December 6th, 1832, the Savior told the prophet Joseph Smith that these angels, these four angels, so what he's saying is that these, this vision of the four chariots is, is the same vision that John has seen in chapter 7, 1 through 3 of the four angels. These angels were crying unto him day and night for permission to reap down the earth and burn down and to burn the tares. Zechariah 6 7 states that the angels could not go forth upon the earth until given permission by the Lord. So in 1832, there are four angels begging God to let us go down and just reap the earth. Burn the tares, burn the wicked, the destroying. This is what we would refer to as the destroying angels. Okay? But they need God's permission to do that. And by 1832, Joseph Smith tells us they were seeking his permission. They hadn't got it yet. 61 years after the revelation in section 86 of the Doctrine and Covenants was given, President Wilford Woodruff declared that the Lord had released those destroying angels and they were then upon the earth sparing the tares from the wheat in preparation, I apologize, separating the tares from the wheat in preparation for the burning that would soon take place. That is the burning of the coming of Christ. Here's what President Woodruff says. So 61 years after Section 86 is given. That is, let me go back to the slide. Section 86, 4 through 7, is where Joseph Smith says that these angels were crying unto Joe, please let us go down. Let us kill the wicked. Let us go down and reap. And Jehovah keeps saying, no, not yet, not yet. Well, President Wilford Woodrow, 61 years later, says this. God has held the angels of destruction for many years. At least they should reap down the wheat with the tares. But I want to tell you now that those angels have left the portals of heaven and they stand over this people and this nation now and are hovering over the earth waiting to pour out the judgments. And from this very day, they will be poured out. 
Calamities and troubles are increasing in the earth, and there is a meaning to these things. Remember this and reflect upon these matters. If you do, your duty, and I do my duty, will have protection and shall pass through the afflictions in peace and in safety. A great promise, but also a great prophetic insight. The destroying angels have been let loose. Do you think some of the judgments and the calamities and troubles that come down here are just happenstance and mistake? No. Not according to a prophet of God. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, Now I want to make I want to make some comments in regarding to the statement by President Wilfred Rudruff and this parable. The parable of the Wheat and Terrors in 86. So this comment that I just read to you, I want he says, I want to make a comment about it. The Lord said that the sending forth of these angels was to be at the end of the harvest, and the harvest is the end of the world. Now, that ought to cause us some very serious reflection, and the angels have been pleading, as I have read it to you, before the Lord to be sent out on their mission. Until 1893, the Lord said to them, No, and then he set them loose. According to the revelation of President Wilford Woodruff, the Lord sent them out on that mission. What do we gather out of that? That we are at the time of the end. This is the time of the harvest. This is the time spoken of, which is called the end of the world. Now that doesn't mean it's coming next week. Don't, don't get overly fraught and anxious with this. That doesn't mean it's next year. That it means that we don't have another thousand years to go through another time period. This is the time period where it will all culminate. But there are still a great many things to happen. Christ's second coming is not next week. It's not next year. It's not in two years. I won't go any further than that. Sidney B. Sperry said, great uh, Old Testament scholar, Zechariah is commanded to adorn Joshua. Oh, this is, I'm sorry, we move on. Those were the, the eight visions. Now we got Zechariah 6, 9 through 15. The symbolic crowning of Joshua the high priest. Brother Sperry said, Zechariah is commanded to adorn Joshua the high priest with a crown made of gold and silver brought by the Babylonian exiles and to say to him, Thus saith Lord of hosts, Behold, a man called Branch, and a branch will come forth from his roots, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Even he will build the temple of the Lord, and he will bear the glory, and sit and rule on his throne, and he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two of them. At 6, 12, and 13. This passage seems to mean that Joshua is crowned as a type of the branch spoken of above who is to arise from David's lineage and to bear his name in the latter days. This king is to rule over the Jews and unite in himself royalty and priesthood and shall counsel and promote the peace of his people. Inasmuch as the latter-day branch was to build the temple of the Lord, so doubtless Joshua was to urge his people to help in the building of the temple then in the process of construction. The crown was then to be placed in the temple as memorial in honor of Hildai, Tobijah, Hadiah, and Joshua, the exiles from Babylon. Well, who is going to build the temple in Jerusalem and bring it about and will be the king of the Jews at the time? This is obviously in reference to Jesus Christ and his millennial reign. Now, the temple will be built prior to Christ's second coming in Jerusalem before he comes millennial. So that's why I said it's not next year. I, don't, I haven't seen a temple in Jerusalem yet, so watch for that. Zechariah 7, 1 through 14, righteousness more important than ritual. This chapter contains the explanation of why the Lord refused to hear the prayers of Judah and permitted Nebuchadnezzar to scatter the Jews from their homeland for a time. It begins with the question of whether the Jews who had returned from Babylon should continue to observe the feast and fast that they had observed while in exile as memorials of the burning of Jerusalem and the temple at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. So, should we keep those feasts in, in memory of? Zacharias answers, answer, Zacharias's answer, which is intended to reach the ears of all, that is, the pre-exiled prophets, I'm sorry, of all people, 
verse 5, is of special significance when we remember his profound interest in the temple. It shows that he, like the former, that means the pre-exiled prophets, cared infinitely more for righteousness than for ritual. Okay, now don't get confused. God wants us to do things in a certain way. We have rituals, sacraments, temple ordinances, baptismal ordinances. But they are only meant to point us to righteousness and to Christ and get us to change our hearts. If the rituals, if we just do them for ritual's sake and they don't change our hearts, then they are worthless. Their fasting, he reminds them, like their eating and drinking, did not in any way affect God, but only themselves. His demand, voiced by the, those prophets, was for something very different, for true justice, kindness, and pity in their social relationships, and for the temper which would scorn to exploit the defenseless members of society or to harbor malicious designs against them. This prophetic law, verse 12, that is instruction, Though it had been mediated by the divine spirit, they had willfully rejected, turning a stubborn shoulder. That's verse 11. Like an animal that refused to bear the yoke, with the result that Jehovah was indignant. Verse 12. Scattered them among the nations. Verse 14. And abandoned their lovely land to desolation. Also verse 14. So that's what he's saying. The church in the Old Testament, and it is time, the reason why... Jerusalem gets destroyed and carried away because the people, they didn't use the ordinances and covenants to point them to Christ and to change their heart and to change the natural man. They just did them to do them because that's what they were asked to do. And they went through the motions. I go to church, I partake the sacrament, I go home and I watch TV. No, it's got to be more than that or they're worthless. Gospel principle, just formally keeping the rituals of the gospel will avail us nothing. They must cause a change of heart. Zechariah 7, 5, and chapter 8, 19. What was the purpose of the feasts? While the Jews were in captivity in Babylon, they celebrated four different feasts in remembrance of the events that took place where Babylon attacked and destroyed Jerusalem. One feast was celebrated in the 10th month, the month in which the Babylonian laid siege to Jerusalem, Jeremiah 39.1. A second feast celebrated in the 4th month commemorated the destruction of Jerusalem, as Jeremiah 39.2. A third feast held in the 4th month marked the destruction of the temple, Jeremiah 52.12-14. And then a fourth feast was celebrated in the 7th month to commemorate the assassination of Gedalia, the puppet king placed over Judah by the Babylonians after they destroyed Jerusalem. Well, Zachar reminded the people that they had set up the feast days to remember them of tragedies, but not once did they remember the Lord through feast while in captivity. We well, set those up to remember those. Why in captivity did you ever have any feast to remember me? Gospel principle, whether feast or temple worship, all things in the gospel are to point to Christ, or they are of no benefit. They weren't using the feast as they were probably intended, and they're only remembering the destruction, and they weren't pointing themselves to Christ. All the things we do, if they don't point to Christ, it's a waste of our time. Zechariah 8, 1 through 8. Why did Zechariah, what did Zechariah envision here? Well, Roy A. Welker, a gospel scholar, said, looking at Jerusalem as he saw it during the period when God's people were scattered on the earth, Zechariah spoke of a broken city denuded of both the very old and very young. The vision given to him by the Lord permitted him to see a future day in which Jerusalem shall be a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord, the temple and shall stand once again. Old men and old women shall dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Verses 4 through 5. So, see, those people were absent at that time, so he's seen a vision of the latter days. Like Joel and other prophets, Zechariah vigorously condemned Israel's sins, yet he foresaw a restoration of God's favors as a reward for repentance and adherence to his laws. 
He was an optimist who loved to linger on the bright and beautiful things of life, though not afraid to recognize and make known the ills that needed to be corrected. He liked to think of Jerusalem restored to her one-time glory, filled with many families of happy children, and with prosperity and peace abounding all around, with hate and selfishness banished in God's tender care and loving guiding and tender care and love guiding his children. Too often are people prone to consider the gloomy side of the message of the prophets. A little care will lead to the realization that the bright side overshadows the darker one and reveals a hope for the future in which God and right will triumph and the world emerge in righteousness as he wills. Zechariah is one whose visions of light excelled many others. Well, Zechariah 8, 11 through 17, a promise to Judah. The Lord promised to gather Judah. See the JST Zacharias 8, 13, footnote 13b in your scriptures. And restore the people to the land of Jerusalem. The heavens would no longer be sealed and the thirsty land would become productive. As the promises of punishment were fulfilled to their forefathers, just as surely will the promises of blessings be fulfilled. See verses 14 through 15. The Lord will require then, as always, that ye speak every man the truth to his neighbor, execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates, let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. Love no false oath. Again, don't swear falsely. The gospel principle the restoration and gathering of Israel will only be accomplished in obedience to the laws and ordinances of the Lord. May we love them. May we do them to point us to Christ, not just to do them. Zechariah 8, 20, 23. When will this prophecy be fulfilled? A time will come in the history of the earth when the work will spread from city to city. Many people will then come to the tribe of Judah to attain from them the knowledge of these blessings. This prophecy will be fulfilled when the tribe of Judah turn their hearts to the God of Israel, accept the responsibility of the priest and keep the commandments. Then peace will come to a troubled land and to the people. As you can see, that is still not yet fulfilled. We don't even have a temple there. We don't even preach the gospel yet in Jerusalem and in the land of Judah. It is possible that the word Jew is here is used here to refer to Israelites in general and not just the descent of the tribe of Judah, which makes sense that Judah was an area, not just those who belonged to the tribe of Judah. We do not have covenant Israel in the land of Israel yet. Now there are BYU students who go to the center there and we have, you know, a branch for them and they hold service and stuff, but we don't do any mission work. There's no gospel priest there and there's not the church established there like in other places. Gospel principle. We are fulfilling prophecy as we turn our hearts to God in obedience to his gospel and keep the commandments. What a glorious time we live in. What great opportunities. What things we are yet to see are going to be beyond our comprehension and our wildest imaginations. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and please subscribe to the channel.